Okay. You know, I really call it a privilege that I have every once in a while to stand before you and substitute for Pastor Steve. It's a, it's a real privilege, and I thank, thank him for trusting me with the pulpit, and we'll see where we go today. I've got a long text in Romans that I could use, but we're going to concentrate on one little section of it. But first, I want to ask you, have you ever spoken to somebody that's leaving and say, hey, good luck on your trip, or Oh, I sure was lucky that I won that lottery. Or, you know, somewhere in your life you use the word luck. Is that good? Is that a good word for the Christian to use? Uh, does luck have anything to do with what's going to happen, where you're going to go? Is Steve... And family going to have good luck as they travel back from uh, Fort Collins today? I don't think so. I think the scripture gives us an example of what we really are supposed to be thinking. I've heard many people say, well, how fortunate I was to do X. Um, how fortunate you are to do whatever. That's good. I've heard other people say, Godspeed. I remember distinctly when I left the airport in Valletta, Malta, many years ago that the engineer that I was with that was staying, I was going to go home after two months. I think my wife was glad for that. But anyway, I, why I remember it, I don't know. But Bob said as we parted at the airport, God's speed. And, you know, I've tried to kind of incorporate that into some of my speaking to people. Romans 8 is where we want to look at today. And although Romans 8 is such a wonderful book, chapter, that, you know, we could spend weeks and weeks talking about what is in Romans 8 for us. But I'm going to start with the 28th verse, which I'm sure is very familiar to many of you. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. The text for our message this morning. Pray with me. Father, as we look at this bit of the 8th chapter of Romans, we pray that you would just speak to each one of us and give to us that which we need today. Help us to realize that you are at work. Things don't happen just because of so-called luck, but you're working and you're causing all things to happen according to your perfect will. Thank you for today, for giving us this time. We commit the hour to you. In Christ's name, amen. What about coincidences? That's eh, kind of a kissing cousin to uh, luck. Have you ever had something happen and you would say, what a coincidence? Well, 
Again, I believe that we find that God, we don't know why, but He puts us in positions where we say, Huh? Why did that happen? That, uh, you know, we encounter somebody that we don't expect to, to see. And of course, if you're like me, you have no idea what their name is. You just, you know, you see somebody like we did one time. We were, we had flown from St. Louis where we were living. We went up to Seattle and we were in the uh, area there waiting for our luggage. And I looked at a couple of people and I thought, you know, I've got to know who they are. Well, I never did get their names and I don't remember even today who they were. But it was, you know, why? Why, why did that happen? Strange. But uh, you do have this happen. I'm sure each one of you can relate to an incident where, why? Why did God put me in this position? A couple of three weeks ago, we needed to go into a doctor's office and we walked into the waiting area and these people I knew right in front of me there was a woman and her daughter sitting there waiting and this daughter happened to be uh, Elaine Schallenberger whose picture and note is on the board there. She's home, or she was home from Jos, Nigeria. She's a Wycliffe missionary there. But I never expected to find Elaine there with her mother. Her mother doesn't live here. She used to. She lives in Wheatland, Wyoming. Now, you know, I've pondered that. Why, what was the point that God had for us to meet those people there that don't even, you know, we had absolutely no idea that they were there. But we had a chance to talk for a few minutes and uh, I talked to Steve about this the other day and his main point with why we meet somebody like that is that maybe God had some purpose. It was necessary for something that we see these people. You know, we encounter folks like that every once in a while, and we really wonder why or what God has in mind for us. Sometimes we'll find out Now, Tim Johnson found out a so-called happening that at the time you wonder why. You know, here he is looking for a new home and he falls down and breaks his arm. Okay, why? But it wasn't, but... I guess that day or the next day, anyway, soon thereafter, in the emergency room or someplace in the hospital, they found out that he had cancer. He had something wrong with his arm. And that's where the break was, is is at that point in the tumor. If he had not broken his arm... How long would it have been before they discovered the cancer? You wonder. But, for some reason, God orchestrated the situation. Remember, Romans 8.28 says, God works all things for good to those that love Him. Well, it ends up that... uh, Because they found the cancer so early, I understand now that it is going to be relatively easy to treat. And he did have 
uh, Tuesday, he had his first chemo, and it looks like uh, there will only be a few chemo treatments. Well, God works these things out. God is in control. You know, that's the one thing that I think that a lot of times we tend to forget. But God is in control. Nothing escapes Him. Nothing happens that He doesn't know about. And we have to just trust that the things that happen, there is a reason. We may not know in this lifetime why, but there is a reason for it. And we just need to, to keep that in mind. Another thing that might be familiar to you is Joseph. Remember, Joseph was, was a young man that his brothers hated. And uh, he had quite a life for a while. They sold him off. Instead of killing Joseph, his brothers sold him off to a, a group of people that were heading for Egypt. And they sold him to, uh, I guess, the Pharaoh. And for the next number of years, he had quite a life. Got accused of sexually harassing the... Uh, Pharaoh's wife got thrown back into prison again and again. And one thing led to another that finally he ended up becoming second in command of the entire Egypt, of all of Egypt, because of dreams that the Pharaoh had that he was able to interpret through God's help. Well, one thing to another, and finally by the, by the near the end of the uh, <clears throat> famine that was going to take place, Jacob died, Joseph's father died, and now the brothers were, oh boy, now what do we do? Joseph's going to really really get to us because of all of the ills that we put him through. In Genesis 50, verse 15, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrong we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you're going to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers for the sins and wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of God, your, of your father. When their message came to Joseph, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down. We are your slaves. But Joseph said, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he assured them and spoke kindly to them. You intended it be, to be bad. We didn't like you, we hated you, and we did everything we could to harm you. But in the end, God's purpose was accomplished. He saved many lives, and as, as, it, as he said, God intended to harm me, or harm me. God intended for harm, but... Or, I'm sorry, the brothers intended it for harm, but God intended it for good. And so, you know, I'm sure that many times Joseph wondered through the years, what in the world, why am I in this position? And yet he found out when, uh, when 
the end came and he saw what had happened, how God had used him throughout the region to save many lives and to keep the family of Jacob alive and, and well. There's another thing that I have uh, wondered about in this uh, either luck or um, coincidences. You remember back a few years ago, 9-11, when the planes took down the towers? If you remember right, there are a number of stories out there as to people that were supposed to be in the towers and weren't. There was all sorts of reasons. Somebody was late. Uh, I, I missed the train. Oh, I, I got sick that day. And, you know, there's just, there's many, many stories of people that uh, were not in the tower that, to their mind, they should have been there. But I think that it is, uh, every time I read one of those, I think, for some reason, God worked it out where those folks were not in the tower. They were not among the 3,000 that died. Uh, it's a puzzle, and I don't pretend to have an answer for you. What I would encourage you and urge you to do is remember that God is in control. And as Romans 8.28 says, He will work all things for good to those that, that love Him and are called according to His purpose. Uh, I came across a, a sermon uh, concerning Romans 8.28 that really kind of struck me and I'd like to to read a small section of the um, of the sermon. This is J John Piper. Anybody know who John Piper is? I see one head going vertically. <laughs> anyway, several years ago he wrote this sermon. And he says, if you, and this is in regard to Romans 8.28, if you live inside this massive promise, your life is as solid as the rock of Gibraltar. Nothing can blow you over inside the walls of Romans 8.28. Outside Romans 8.28 is all confusion and anxiety and fear and uncertainty, straw houses of deafening drugs, tin roofs of retirement plans, cardboard fortifications of anti-ballistic missiles, and a thousand other substitutes for Romans 8.28. Once you walk through that door of love into the massive, unshakable structure of Romans 8.28, everything changes. There, there comes into your life stability and depth and freedom. You simply can't be blown over anymore. The confidence that a sovereign God governs for your good all of the pain and all of the pleasure that you will ever experience is an absolutely incomprehensible, incomprehensible refuge and security and hope and power in your life. No promise in all of the world surpasses the height and breadth and weight of Romans 8.28. Now, as you think back over this, can you think of instances in your life where you meet somebody and you don't know why? Maybe you find out later. Maybe you never will. Maybe it's one of those things. I'm going 
I know when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask the Lord, why did this such and such happen? Well, maybe. But the one thing that we can rest assured in is that He loves us. He is going to take care of us in all of our needs because God is in control. And nothing happens because of pure luck. I, I am one that would like to get that word out of my vocabulary. You know, it just doesn't belong there. If you look up the definition of luck, you will find that it has opposite meanings of what we will find in God's Word. It just, you know, it, it's pure coincidence. No, it isn't. God's in control. And so many times we, we don't understand that. We have to remind ourselves that, that God is in control. And I say again, nothing happens that He is not, he, that He escapes His knowledge. He loves us and He is going to take care of us. We don't need to get concerned about worrying. And I've already talked to you in past times about worry. Worry is something that, you know, you don't want. It's not part of the, the Christian's life. Paul makes that clear. But that's the thing is, we need to, as John Piper said in the sermon, there is no promise greater in all of the world than the promise given to us in Romans 8.28. So I urge you to keep that in mind and make it, make it really part of your life. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you and praise you for being such a great God and loving us so much taking care of us in our many needs. Thank you for working things out for our good, things that happen that we don't understand, we don't like. We just we wonder as to why such and such is happening to us. And yet, Lord, we know that you're in control and that you know what's going to happen. And your perfect will is going to be accomplished. Thank you for the great love that we just marvel at. We certainly don't understand how you can love us like you do. But we do thank you that your word tells us that you do love us. And you're going to work things out in all circumstances for our good. Thank you for the time that we've had here this morning. We do pray for the pastor and his family as they travel back to Grand Junction. Lord, give them journey mercies and keep them safe. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Pastor always ends with a benediction. I'm going to have one that's a little different. From Hebrews. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every good thing for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom Glory be glory forever and ever. Amen.